like to invite our uh, ushers to come forward. We're going to receive a, our offering. And if you're a guest with us today, we would simply ask nothing more of you. Uh, but we would love to have a connection card turned in by you. If you could, uh, would love to pray for any requests that you have or have a record of your visit. Um, but our, our regular attenders and our members take care of our financial needs here as a church. So uh, let's just ask God to bless this time. Father, we thank you for the, the chance to uh, give back to you. We recognize 100% of our blessings and our, our, our benefit comes from you. And so uh, this is just an opportunity to worship you by giving back a portion. And God, we pray that you'd use it, not just for our benefit and comfort, but God, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So as they pass those uh, offering plates again, just a, a couple of words of announcement. If you didn't grab a bulletin on the way in, I hope that you'll grab one from the plate there. There's a lot of important things happening in December. We've got our uh, all-church caroling here. Uh, I think December 7th, is that right, Mr. Steve? December 7th, and so everybody's invited to that. You don't find many people that go out caroling anymore, but it's a tradition for us here at Temple, so I uh, would love to have you join our Awana ministry on that night. <clears throat> One other thing I want to talk about this morning briefly is that our uh, we're, we're getting geared up for our next semester of growth groups, and uh, the details for those groups are due by December 11th, so that's just two short weeks from today. If God is leading you to maybe lead a growth group uh, starting in January, then we need to know that information by uh, December 11th, and we're looking forward to a great, a great, great semester of growth groups, and uh, uh, as our growth groups are kind of wrapping up for this, uh, this semester, it's awesome to see a lot of the different outreach and a lot of the different uh, connection that's happening amongst people in those groups. So if you've never participated in a growth group, uh, I'd encourage you to be looking forward to January and uh, get plugged into, into one. So anyways, we're going to start today a brand new study in the Gospel of Luke. And originally in my planning, I hadn't I hadn't planned to start Luke until into uh, 2017, but you know, it's kind of hard to talk about baby Jesus in like January. It's kind of like you missed the boat when that happens. And so I thought, well, let's just go ahead and start now. And uh, we'll be talking about baby Jesus in December, which is kind of fitting. And uh, we'll, today we're going to have basically a background and introduction to this book, this book of Luke. And so if you have a Bible or a device uh, that has a Bible app on it, I'd encourage you to turn to Luke chapter one right now. If you don't have either of those, there's a Bible somewhere around you in the back of a seat or up on the balcony on the edges that we would love for you to be able to take and use. Because uh, here's the deal, don't take my word for anything. Uh, I want you to take God's word. And that's really what we're here to uh, study and to open our hearts and our minds to uh, as we uh, as we venture into this book of Luke. And so I want to just read the first four verses of this book, and that's really what we're going to focus on today. So in Luke chapter 1, and if you're new to the Bible, if you kind of open it up in the middle and then go right for a little ways, you're going to find Matthew, Mark, Luke. If you get to John, you've gone too far. Luke chapter 1, verse 1. It's what it says, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They, are used, they use the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write a careful account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. So there's a lot of information contained in these four verses that's going to help us have an understanding of, of this book. And so today I'm really just attempting to answer some of the basic questions, right, that you would face the who, the what, the when, the why, and the how uh, when you begin to really apply yourself to understand something. And so let's just talk about who was Luke. Who was Luke? Well, we find that in Scripture, he's the only Gentile or the only non-Jewish writer of any of the New Testament books, the only one that wasn't Jewish by ethnic background. Luke actually wrote a sequel to the Gospel of Luke, and that's the book in our New Testament called Acts, or Acts of the Apostles. And uh, some, some in the early church actually had considered both of them to be one work. 
So they didn't really have two separate books. They basically just looked at Luke and Acts as one work, one kind of cohesive thing, because Luke really picks up where Acts leaves off. If we look into Acts chapter 1, verse 1, it, it begins like this. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So at the beginning of, of Acts, Luke again says, hey, in my first book, I wrote about everything up until Christ died and went back to heaven and gave commands to the apostles. And then Acts basically takes it from there outward. Uh, there's this image, it's on the screen, it's kind of an interesting dynamic, and you can think about Luke, everything in the book of Luke essentially is, is pointing towards Jerusalem, uh, and actually in one place in, in the book of Luke, um, in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says, the time drew near for him to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. So Jesus' life and mission on earth basically culminated at Jerusalem, right? Uh, at the time of the Passover where he ultimately was offered as the Passover lamb of God that was fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah, the one that God would send to save his people uh, ultimately. And so all of Luke kind of basically funnels towards Jerusalem and Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And then the book of Acts essentially goes out from Jerusalem and chronicles the spread of Christianity, the, the early apostles, the early disciples' uh, activities as they go out from Jerusalem into all the world to make disciples of Christ. And so you can kind of think of Acts and Luke as really one work that basically have two different sides. And so let's continue talking about who was Luke. We, it never mentions Luke in the book of Luke, right? So it's not, it's not named by the author. And even in the book of Acts, it doesn't clearly say Luke is the author, but there's a number of things in the book of Acts that very clearly point to Luke as the author. There's a lot of um, uh, places that are called the we passages. As the book of Acts is being narrated and written, it's in third person until it comes to a certain point when basically Luke joins the party, and then all the pronouns change to we. Instead of they got off the boat and traveled to this city, it then becomes we left that city and went to the next city. And so uh, scholars have looked at this for, for many you know, centuries, and it's very widely accepted that Luke is the author of, of both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. No early church fathers uh, credited the book to anyone else. Uh, it is very, very clearly accepted uh, in Christianity that Luke is the author. One interesting thing about Luke is we, we tend to think of the New Testament and we, we believe that Paul, you know, Paul wrote almost all the letters that are in the New Testament. And we kind of consider that Paul wrote most of the New Testament, which by, if you're counting the number of books in there, yes. But if you're counting the number of words, Luke actually wrote most of the New Testament. If you count the number of words, Luke is a very big book, Acts is a very big book, and those two books together contain the majority of the words in the New Testament. And so it's very, very important that we kind of have an understanding of who Luke was. He was a physician. Uh, he was a, 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 really a scientist in that world. And so when we think of someone who is carefully examining evidence and writing a, a document supporting the things that have happened, uh, I think it's very important to take that person's background into consideration. And Luke was a, uh, was a doctor. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, Paul mentions Luke. He says, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. An interesting point about Luke being a doctor, a medical doctor, is that it's well known that Paul, right, who wrote Colossians, who was mentioning Luke, had a lot of health issues. Paul had ongoing health problems that to have a, a medical doctor accompanying him on his journey was a, was a huge advantage and, and might be one of the key reasons why Luke actually accompanied Paul in so many of his journeys was because Luke was a doctor and Paul was a sick man. 
And so we, we find these things going together. So Luke is also referenced in a couple other passages in the New Testament. In 2 Timothy 4.11, Paul says that Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's useful to me for ministry. Paul says, only Luke is with me. In Philemon chapter 1, verse 23 and 24, uh, Paul says, Epap Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristocrus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. And so Luke has this, this testimony throughout the New Testament of being one of Paul's most faithful, if not most faithful, companions throughout his journeys, throughout his missionary trips. And, and that's important because it's, it's key because Luke wasn't there. Luke wasn't an eyewitness. He wasn't one of the 12 disciples originally mentioned, right? He wasn't one that was privy personally to some of those inner things that, that, uh, that went on with Christ and his followers, but he assembled, and we're going to talk about how he did that, the testimony. Let's also talk about who the book is written to. Because this is the only gospel that's actually written to an individual, a specific person, and it says most excellent Theophilus is who Luke addresses this book to. This word, this Greek name actually means friend of God or lover of God. And because it means that, some people have looked at, at Theophilus as just a term that means everyone that loves God in general, right? So like to all Christians or all followers of Christ, this book is written to you. Specifically, though, I think there's a lot more evidence that this title was to an actual person. And most scholars would believe that, that Theophilus was probably an official or an officer in, in the Roman government or in the army because of the title that's used. And so he's probably a very prominent person in society, uh, whether it was in the government or just as an individual in society, and uh, that someone that potentially Luke had discipled and that Luke wrote this book to be basically a discipleship manual, because what does he say? He said, it's so that you may be certain of the truths that you were taught. And we're going to come back to that. So Theophilus, it's an interesting <coughs> thing to think about and to, to wonder about. Um, but ultimately, it's, it's, it's what Luke is about is what we're going to focus mostly on this morning. And I know today is a little more cerebral. Some of you guys love to just kind of study background and study characters and, and kind of go deep and, and, and find all the interconnectedness of, of uh, characters in the Bible. Others of you, maybe that's not so much your cup of tea, but today is kind of a more of a background message. And I really want to kind of give an overview of what Luke is about. What Luke is about. I would, I would say the key verse and the whole book is probably chapter 19, verse 10. And it simply reads, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost. The Son of Man was the title that, that Jesus liked to use for himself, and that's going to be kind of a key title for him in the book of Luke. And it's, it's focused on seeking and saving those who are lost. And it's interesting because of the four Gospels, they all have a little bit of a different angle on Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? There's the four Gospels, and each of them are kind of written from a little bit of a different angle. You've, you've heard the analogy that like, you know, four blind men that are feeling an elephant are going to give you widely different stories. You know, the guy that's at the back, he's going to say, hey, an elephant's like a rope, you know, because he's feeling the tail. The guy on the side is like, an elephant's like a wall, because he's feeling the side of the elephant. And the guy at the front is like, the elephant's like a big fire hose, you know, he's feeling the trunk. And so that, that's kind of how blind men would describe an elephant. But even seeing men would describe an elephant a little differently if they were looking at it from different angles. Am I right? You know, if you're looking at an elephant from the front, you don't see the tail. You're not going to tell about the tail because you can't see it. You can see the, 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 you know, the trunk and the tusks and all that stuff. So the four gospels provide four different views of Jesus. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what are called the synoptic gospels, and that's just a fancy uh, Latin term that means one view. Synoptic means, it means that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are kind of written from the front, so to speak, right? That you've got Matthew, Mark, and Luke, three different authors that are writing about the same thing, right? The life and ministry of Jesus Christ, and they're coming at it from essentially the same viewpoint. 
Because as you read through the Gospels, and if you've never read through, there's something called the harmony of the Gospels. And it's really helpful when you're studying the New Testament because it basically takes Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and it kind of puts them all together. Because when you, when you read through all that, you'll, you'll read a story and you'll be like, I've read that before. Oh yeah, because that exact same story is right here in a different gospel. Oh, okay, and it's over here again. And so you see Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke are the synoptic gospels. So they're kind of presenting one general viewpoint of Jesus, whereas the book of John... It stands a little bit unique because about 93% of the material in, material in John is unique to John. It's, it's, it's material about Jesus and his life and ministry that's not contained in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so it's important to know when you're reading through the Gospels, that's kind of how they all approach Jesus. And they present Jesus in a little different terms. Matthew is more or less written to a Jewish audience, and it presents Jesus as the Messiah, the King of Israel, right? Not, not entirely, but ex not exclusively, but it kind of focuses on presenting Jesus as such because that's kind of the audience. Now, Mark really presents Christ as the suffering servant, kind of the, fulfilling that prophetic uh, role, prophet, priest, and king that, that Christ kind of fulfilled. And so, so Mark presents Christ in that way, and Luke presents Jesus as the Son of Man or the atoning priest, the one who brings peace and makes things right for all people. And the book of John essentially presents Christ and his deity as the Son of God and the Lord of all. And so when you, when you look at the four Gospels, they all kind of present the same Jesus, but they're presenting a slightly different view of that same Christ. And so it's helpful. Just like if you wanted to know what an elephant looked like, it would be helpful to know what an elephant looked like from four different perspectives instead of just one. So some people that are critical of the New Testament, you know, see, see these four different Gospels and, and try to kind of find, find a way that says, well, I don't really believe that because, you know, Mark says this and then Luke says this and, you know, and truly there's no conflict. It's really just a, a rounded viewpoint. And so it, it helps us exactly have what, what Luke is intended to have certainty of the truth that we were taught. Luke focuses more on Jesus' interaction with those who are on the social fringe than any of the gospel, any of the other gospel writers. So last week we, we looked at the 10 lepers from Luke and uh, we saw that, that Luke really focused on Jesus' interaction with these lepers. And so those that are outcasts, including tax collectors, children, Gentiles, Samaritans, women, and lepers, we find that Luke is really the gospel writer that portrays Jesus' interaction the most with the fringe of society, that he was the one that's sent to seek and to save those who were lost. And so as we kind of study through the book of Luke this, this whole next year, maybe this morning you, would, you wouldn't consider yourself someone who's lost. Like you would consider yourself found, right, by God, that, that he's already found you, that you have a relationship with God. Maybe though that through this process, God's bringing to your mind someone who is lost, someone who has not yet been found by God. And so I, I hope that you're starting to think about that because that's really Luke, Luke's focus. And I hope that this, this series will help us reach out to some of our friends who, who are spiritually lost or spiritually looking. Let's talk about briefly, you know, when was Luke written? And, and this isn't hugely important for most of us, but it's interesting. You know, most likely around AD 60 or 61. Uh, Acts the book of Acts ends with Paul's imprisonment in Rome before his death, which happened around A.D. 64. And then Luke records Jesus' prophecy of the temple's destruction, but doesn't mention its fulfillment in A.D. 70. Well, why is that even important? You know, why, why is it important to know that Luke was written around A.D. 60, 61? Because it's, it's incredibly important, again, for the, the purpose that the book was written, so that you and I and others can be certain of the truth that we were taught. Because there's, there's a, a huge amount of importance between in the, the amount of time that goes on between an event happens and when it's written down. You understand? So just in, in, in history in general, right? So like if, if I wanted today to go about and to, to write a, a clearly written, concise, and accurate 
a count of, say, I don't know, the Cold War, okay? Something, when was the Cold War? Was that 80s, right? About 30 years ago, roughly. If I wanted to write an account of the Cold War, I could go and I could have personal interviews with, with government officials, right? With, with military operatives, with all kinds of people who would be able to know from firsthand experience what happened in the whole Cold War, Cold War era, right? Like it's enough time that those people are still alive. And if I wanted to just put out some work that was complete rubbish, right? I wanted to just make up something like, hey, the Cold War was really about aliens, right? And it was, and some of you believe this, but it was about aliens. Some of you are like, I knew it. I'm not the only one. It was about aliens and this happened and this, and there's a big cover up and a conspiracy. And I published this thing. There's enough people. There's still close enough to the actual events that have happened that people could say, um, no, I was there, and that is not what happened. So it's incredibly important that these things are chronicled and written down, and, and we have manuscript evidence, right, that goes all the way back to early first century that documents and demonstrates, right, that this stuff was written down early. This stuff is accurate because if it wasn't accurate, people could have risen up and said, you know what? It's garbage, and it's not gonna it's not gonna proliferate like it would if if it had the broad support of the community that it happened within. And so, why is it important? Because uh, you know, if, if you say, well, you know, it doesn't really matter if it was written, you know, ninety or in AD one twenty, it does matter actually. If you're if you're wanting to have the benefit of why Luke was written, so that you could have certainty of the truth in which you're taught, it matters a lot. And so these things are, are important. So let's kind of go on and talk about how Luke was written. So we've talked about kind of who and what and when. Let's talk about how was Luke written. We believe, I believe, I'm not going to speak for you, I believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is inspired by God. And most of us in this room, you know, if you've, if you've kind of grown up in, in Christianity, that's a core essential doctrine of Christianity, that we believe in the Bible as God's holy inspired word. It doesn't mean that it's inspiring like something that Tim Tebow might say is inspiring, right? I love Tim Tebow. The stuff that he puts on, his little memes and stuff, it's great. It's inspiring. It's not inspired, okay? What do we mean that when we say all scripture is inspired by God? Because sometimes I think we, we can have this viewpoint, well, it says like, well, I guess like God like super like possessed them and they just kind of went into a trance uh, and started writing, right? Like we, we might have that view of just like, well, could God do that? God could do that, sure. And we, you know, different points in scripture, we see God actually, hey, God could speak through a donkey, right? So he could write through a human, right? I, I believe that. But that's not what the Bible itself says. What did, what did Luke say? Luke, in, in chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, Luke says this, Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write a careful account for you. So Luke is, is, is saying, hey, I'm not, the, I'm not the first to do this. There are many accounts that have already been written about what happened, right? And so most people would look at the book of Luke and they'd say, well, I believe that Luke drew heavily from Mark and probably heavily from Matthew as well. So both of these other gospel writers, and there's, you know, there's debate, scholars, all this stuff all over the place. But to say that, you know, Mark, if, if Matthew, Mark, and Luke are three authors and they're looking at the same thing, I would say Mark's right in the middle because there's very little in the book of Mark that's not in the book of Matthew or Luke. Only about 7%, roughly, of the book of Mark is, is completely unique that's not mentioned or listed in Matthew or Luke or in John, okay? So, so, Matt, so Mark's kind of the, in the center, right? These three that are viewing it from essentially the same angle. 
Matthew's over here, and Matthew sees some stuff that Luke, uh, that Mark and Luke don't see, and Luke sees some stuff that Matthew and Mark don't see, but both Matthew and Luke see most of the stuff that Mark sees. Is that completely confusing? I apologize if it is. But what Luke is saying is saying, hey, I'm using what other eyewitnesses and people that have interviewed eyewitnesses, right? They've all, they've done this, and I've done my own research to confirm, right? And I've carefully investigated everything from the beginning. Carefully investigate every from, everything from the beginning so that I could also write a very detailed and careful account so that we may be certain of the truth. And so when you come to Luke, there's about, and scholars vary, right? Anywhere between 30-something to 70% of Luke being unique to itself. But you can read through Luke and you find stories that aren't in Matthew or Mark or John. And, and Luke himself says, I have... I have investigated carefully. So when you see in Luke chapter 24, and there's, there's two disciples, they're walking on the road to Emmaus, and, and suddenly Jesus kind of starts walking along with them and starts talking with them and later reveals that it's Jesus to these two disciples. And that's not in any of the other Gospels. But it's in Luke's Gospel. And Luke says that I have conducted personal interviews with the eyewitnesses of these events and I'm carefully detailing them for you. And so I'm not, gonna, I'm, I'm not saying anything more than Scripture says, but simply from what Luke says about his writing process would lead us to believe that, hey, Luke interviewed those two guys. Matthew and Mark and John didn't. And so Luke's going to include that in his gospel, that he was inspired by God to write, and that's been recognized through all of, of Christian history as inspired in, in doctrinal. So... There's a whole study of this canonization, which means the completion and the measuring of what books go into the Bible. And there's some articles that are referenced for you in the notes today to kind of research that on your own, because it's important, right? It's important. Sometimes we, uh, we don't do the, the work of, of, of really helping ourselves grow in our confidence and our certainty of our faith. And so there's some, some notes in there, some resources for you to do more work on your own that we just don't have time to really cover this morning. But all scripture is inspired by God. I want to I want to share with you one, one more verse before we move on to our last point. And it's from 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21. And so this is a book that Peter, right, one of the three closest disciples of our Lord and Savior, wrote. He said this: He said, For we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes when he received glory, honor and glory from God the Father. The voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Now that, what, what, what Peter is talking about is, is the Mount of Transfiguration, which is listed and which is told for us in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so Peter's kind of re retelling this story that he's also told to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and each of those three have written about. And now Peter, in this letter, is also telling it in his own words and saying, hey, we didn't make this stuff up. We didn't, we didn't just make up some clever story. This is what we received from God. And he goes on. He says, we ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. You must pay close attention to what they wrote, for their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and Christ the morning star shines in your hearts. Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. And, and oftentimes in the New Testament even, you find the New Testament writers acknowledging other New Testament writers in their writings as Scripture. Not just the Old Testament, but also the New Testament. An example of this is when Paul wrote to Timothy, he quoted a passage from Luke's Gospel as Scripture. In 1 Timothy 5.18, Paul said, The Scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads the grain, which is a quote from Deuteronomy. But he goes on, and... The laborer is worthy of his wages, which is a quote from Luke 10, 7. 
And so it's a very clear witness of the, the apostles themselves of the, the scripture quality of the gospels, and even in this case, the gospel of Luke. And so we see that how it was written, I don't claim to understand all the dynamics of how, how God inspired those human writers, right? Because they, they, they wrote with their style. When you read the letters of Paul, you see a style there, just as if you were reading a number of letters that I had written to a number of my friends. You'd kind of pick up, okay, this is how he signs it, and this is his greeting, and this is the way that he talks. And the same with Luke. Luke writes in a very specific style that's different from Matthew or Mark or John. So he uses the human person, right, but, but inspires the content to be ultimately and truthfully God's word. So part of it is faith. Let's just, let's just put it out there because the truth is what, what you accept about the Bible, you accept by faith. There's lots of evidence. There's plenty of evidence. There's more, there's more manuscript evidence for the Bible than any other ancient book by far. That's not even comparable for the accuracy. And ultimately by faith comes hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I want to move on and really kind of focus this morning and kind of wrap up with the point of why Luke was written. We've talked about the who, the what, the when, the how, and I want to talk about the why and kind of, kind of lead us to an application focus because like I said, you know, today's a little more cerebral than, than normal. Uh, and I want, to, I want to make sure that we focus on application for us each, each individually today. Again, Luke was written in, in verse 4 of chapter 1 so that we can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. So that we can be certain of the truth of everything that we've been taught. And there's a dynamic that happens in churches. And it's not just, you know, unique to our church. It's, it's probably every church that I've known about or been involved with. And that is that when, when young people that are raised in the church, just like I was and just like many of you, actually, let me have a raise of hands. If you were raised in a Christian church, would you raise your hand? So, so many of us, but probably at least two-thirds maybe, um, were, were raised in a Christian environment growing up. And, and it's, it's all too common that when someone's raised in a Christian environment and they get out of high school, that they, they go away from the Christian faith for a while. And that's a very sad dynamic, right? And there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think some of the reasoning is, is because you know, we, we've grown up kids and we've just told them stories and we've taught them truths, but we haven't taught them confidence in the truths that they were taught. And at some point in life, you know, you're going you're gonna to run up against things that cause you to doubt. And I'm not just saying just as a college kid going off to a, you know, a, a secular college campus, even just as an adult, right? Some of us may have been sheltered from, from bad things, but at some point in time, you're going to run up against things that just make you scratch your head and just say, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. And if God is who I've always believed God to be, that just doesn't make sense in light of what I'm seeing or what I'm feeling or experiencing right this second. And if there's not a certainty, if there's not a foundation that you know and that you, you've, you've developed and you've grown over time of truth, that, that truth is truth, no matter, you know, no matter what culture says, no matter what even your, your, your feelings in the moment may say, that truth is truth, and I'm going to live by the truth. And that's certainly not a, a common experience in today's culture at all. That we've kind of lost the, 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 the knowledge or the understanding of objective truth. And that's why a study of Luke is so important, because Luke is saying, I have written this, I've taken the time to make a detailed account so that you may be certain of the truth. And what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16, it's really the purpose of all the scripture. He says, all scripture is inspired by God, right? We already read that. Well, let's go on. And is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Do you want to know where the answers lie? 
for, for all of society's problems, right? For all of your problems, for all of my problems, the answers lie within Scripture. I mean, there's so many people that are just really at a loss, even, even individuals who, who claim Christianity to say, well, I think it's okay for me, you know, to have sex before I'm married. Well, what does Scripture say about that? Let me just give you a Cliff Notes version. Don't, okay? That's the summary, right? But, but again, don't take my word for it because I might just be some messed up person that wants you not to have any fun, all right? That's my goal in life, right? Yeah. No, it's because it's what God said. And the, the benefits of all that, and, and it's not to limit, but it's so, that, it's so that humans can flourish and enjoy all of God's good gifts and all of their blessings without the side effects of following our own way instead of his way. And you take any issue, right? I'm not getting on a soapbox about one particular issue today, but you take any particular uh, ill in our society, and you simply go to the Scripture and say, well, what does the Scripture say about that? What does the scripture say about that? Here's what we get from culture, but what, is the, what does God's word say? What is true? Because scripture will show us what's true. It'll show us what's wrong in our lives. You know, sometimes as a pastor, you, I get people that just, you know, that want to have counsel with me, and I'm not a very good counsel. I'll just say it right now. Um, because sometimes people come in, and, and I want to focus on that part of scripture and say, man, I see a whole lot that's wrong with you, you know? And, and, the, and it's not just my viewpoint, the Bible, right? <laughs> you're, you're spilling all your problems, and I'm just saying you're, you're messed up, right? Because honestly, the Bible shows us where we're messed up. It makes us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong, and it teaches us to do what's right. And I'm just reading you the Bible right now. That's all I'm doing. I'm reading you the Bible it, it shows us what's wrong. It teaches us how to do what's right. We have to listen to it. You see, I think we can find, like it says in Timothy, that in the latter days, you know, teachers will come and, and give you whatever your itching ears want to hear. Whatever your itching ears want to hear. And so there's a lot of things that our society will say, hey, well, that's okay. But the Bible clearly says that's not okay. Well, it's because what? It's what we want to hear. We don't want it to be that we're messed up and we need to change our lives to line up with what the Bible says. Man, we could get going, man. We could start talking about giving and we could start talking about all kinds of things that would be really uncomfortable right now, right? I mean, there's just no place that, that the Bible doesn't give instruction our whole life, right? I'm not saying it's going to answer specifically, but it's going to give you a principle that you can apply to that issue in life. It's going to give you wisdom that you say, okay, well, that didn't exist in biblical times, but I can use this principle from the Bible and apply it to my life this day. You see, Luke was written to provide a detailed and accurate account of Jesus' life and work that leads us to a credible faith in Jesus as the savior of all people. I want to invite our, our worship team to come up and I, I guess I just want to challenge us all because you might be someone here this morning and you'd say, you know, Pastor Ken, let me be honest with you. The Bible is a big mystery to me and, and I don't know. I know I'm messed up, but I don't know where to go to find out what's messed up and to find out how to make it right. Well, I want to encourage you because that's one of the reasons that we exist as a church, right? It's not simply, you know, you get together, fellowship. Yes, we do, but we fellowship around the word of God. We want to fellowship around saying, hey, this, you know what? This is what the Bible, let me encourage you with what the Bible says about your situation, about your struggle that you're facing, about this temptation, whatever that is. You know, we need to be called people of the book. That's how the early Christians were known. Do you know that? It's actually how, how um, Muslims refer to Christians originally was people of the book. How far have we fallen? And you know what? How There's never been a time in history where God's word is more accessible to us than it is right this minute. You know, you could get an app on your phone that will, and it'll shoot you a Bible study every day on any particular topic 
that you need or through a, a book or I mean there are so many resources there are so many conveniences that we have at our fingertips to be able to take God's Word into our lives like the psalmist says your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you and so this morning I want to just challenge you if and maybe for nothing else but for an internal commitment that says you know what, pastor Ken 2017 is the year that I get certain in my faith. That uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to devote myself to this study of the book. And, and, and you may be gone some, or you may miss, and you may catch up online, and you just maybe read through it your own, or maybe, I don't know what that looks like for you, but maybe it's just for you. You recognize to say, you know what, the foundation that I stand on is kind of flimsy. If you ask me to have to kind of give a defense of my faith, I don't know if I could. So maybe that's you, and maybe, maybe this, this year that's coming up is a time for you to just get strong, to get confident, to get sure of what you believe and why you believe it. I hope that you'll join us with that. Maybe, maybe God's leading you to lead a growth group kind of towards that end. You know, you don't have to have all the answers, right, to lead a growth group. You just have to be willing to seek them and help others seek them. None of us here have got it all. None of us have all the answers. Believe me. But we need to be people of the book. We need to be people that are, that are using the tools that God's given us to have a strong faith, to be able to embrace and, and, and really live out a faith that says, you know what, Jesus is everything. And it's not about memorizing a bunch of rules. That's not what the Bible is about. The Bible is about getting to know a person that loved you so much that he gave his one and only son to die on the cross to provide forgiveness and peace for you and for me. It's about knowing God. It's not about knowing a bunch of rules or memorizing a bunch of verses. It's about knowing and loving God. Let me ask you this morning, do you know, God, do you know that you have a personal relationship? You've put your faith and trust in the person of Jesus, that he was God's son, he died on the cross, he rose from the dead, he sits at the right hand of God the Father right now making intercession for you and me. And that you put all your eggs in his basket that says, you know what, he is the only way. And that by that faith in him, through God's grace, we're forgiven we're adopted into his family, and we begin a life of following after him. You know, if you've never done that this morning, that's the place to start. Maybe today's that day for you that you say, you know, I'm just going to, I believe, and I'm going to confess my sins to God, and I'm going to ask him to forgive me, and I'm going to step out in faith to live for him. Would you stand with us this morning, and our, our altar is always a time of prayer. You can come down here in the front, grab someone to come with you, go in the lobby, Really, whatever. There's no right way to do it, wrong way to, to just spend this time with God, obediently following after him. Would you join me in prayer? God, we love you. We thank you for how much you've done for us. God, you've done everything for us. Lord, we're not here to earn anything. We're just simply here to respond, respond to your love and grace. God, I pray for anyone that's not really a Christian, that doesn't, doesn't have a a foundation of faith to build everything else in their life from. I pray that they'd step out and put their faith in you. And God, I pray for us that, that maybe we've been a Christian for a long time, but we've just kind of accepted what's been handed down to us. And, and maybe we've never really dug deep for ourselves so that we can be confident, Lord, that we can be sure and that we can have a strong faith, a faith that affects everything else in our lives. God, would you give us that faith? Lord, would you help us to be willing to do the work, God, of studying your word, of, of really applying ourselves to learn it so that we can apply it to our lives and that we can live for you. God, we love you. And we just pray for your will and your way today. In Jesus' name, amen.